action. Hey, Power Athlete Nation. Welcome to another episode of the Premier Podcast of Strength Conditioning Power Athlete Radio. Mr. McQuilkin, great to see you. Great to see you, John. Happy to be here. Uh, <laughs> damn glad to meet you. Damn glad to be here. Well, you know what? It's another episode of Power Athlete Radio, and this one, we are using questions from the hotline. Mm-hmm. But before we do, we had an interesting outing last week. We got a chance to go in and hang out with the guys from Drinking Bros and see how they produce and how they put on their podcast. And I have to say, I was impressed. Very much so. Based in Austin now, they used to be San Antonio. And yeah. You were a guest on their show uh, three or four years three ago. Three or four years when ago. When I first moved down here. Yeah, they were actually in uh, associated with Black Rifle and had a studio in Black Rifle down in San Antonio. Now they've moved up to Austin. And we got a chance to go over there and sit in on their studio, see how they were filming it, setting it up, and more importantly, how they were producing it. And their stuff was next level. They also are a, you know, major, major podcast. I mean, they just had uh, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson on there. Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey. So uh, pretty interesting to see what other podcasts are doing and more importantly, how they're monetizing it and how they're kind of pushing it. You know, I mean, we're not necessarily looking to monetize. We're more about influencing individuals and providing our perspectives to hopefully be a voice of reason in a time of extreme turmoil. And well, there's a lot of range and mission to the podcast. Part of it and why I love it is the expansion of the genealogy. We get to meet some very switched on folks, see what they have to say about performance, training, nutrition, recovery, all things in related to athleticism. And we get the opportunity to see how it fits into the power athlete methodology. You know, um, even though we are the premier podcast in strength conditioning, Ing, sorry. I thought we dropped that. <laughs> we did drop it. I was just waiting for you. Uh, even though we are in that fitness class, I like to think we are as much a education and lifestyle and just really pretty fascinating and like the array of guests that we've brought on. I mean, mm-hmm. we've had, you know, some of, uh, you know, like we had Stephen Collar on. It was funny as we were talking with those guys. They're like, hey, we're getting Stephen Collar on next week. We're like, I already had him. Do you have Angela Duckworth? No, you didn't have her either. What about Matt Lalon? Didn't have him. What about Rob Wolf? So, I mean, we've had some pretty high-end individuals, and it's cool to see how they're producing it and, and uh, any some of the changes that we're going to make here in the podcast room to just make it a little more visually appealing. So, that's, uh, that's my project this week. But before we start hacking this whole room up and changing the feel, adding some different camera angles and just up in our production... Um, we got to answer some questions from the hotline and you know what? They're always hot on the hotline. And, and if you are interested uh-huh. in leaving us a question and having us potentially answer it here on the air, you can call in to 929-464-464. 929-ing-ing-0. Zero. All right, here we go. Training related question. And I'm looking forward to this because it's bringing up some old school, old school training. <laughs> Zach that, Evanesh. That, I, feel, I feel like I should pour like a little bit out of my uh, 40 malt liquor for my homeboy, Zach Evanesh in old every school. Every time. He's great. But uh, <laughs> pulling in from our old school seminar that we used to empower coaches with some different training techniques. All right, here we go. Hey guys, this is Andrew from Iowa. I've been an avid follower of Power Athlete for many years now. First time calling into the hotline. And given the recent weather experience in Texas and all over the Midwest, I was spending some time shoveling, spending many hours shoveling recently. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering, what would household labor like shoveling or doing any type of work similar be considered? Would this be more trunk work we might see at the beginning or end of a workout or would this be more field work we might see in one of the flagship programs like field strong just kind of want your two cents on this thanks a lot bye man that's uh that's pretty good because i remember when i lived in philadelphia and also in kansas city whenever there was like a big snow they'd always put out this warning message hey, be careful when you go out and you start shoveling snow. And then they'd always provide us with some statistics that like men over the age of 40, like heart attacks go up exponentially. Oh, wow. Because, you know, maybe guys been working too much, not training, not necessarily staying in shape. And then they go out there and they start shoveling snow. And as you know, that's kind of a dig transverse plane throw, which would be trunk work combination and field work is obviously Mm -hmm. hands in there. You're in this climate. And then next thing you know, they're they're stripping down because they're sweating and they're out there just digging snow. And then men would go in and have heart attacks. So heart attack numbers would go through the roof 
when there was a big snow because, you know, guys weren't fit enough and then they got to go out and shovel snow. Well, I believe it, especially in the Philadelphia area. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, uh, heart attacks are common, especially when you have a diet of uh, cheesesteak wings and uh, Nick's roast beef. <laughs> and you're just angry <laughs> you're, all you're, the time. You're just drinking yinglings like water. God damn. God bless oh, I, I love yingling. <laughs> um, yeah. The my relationship with snow. I didn't see snow until I got to college and we playing a spring sport, we would have random snowstorms in DC, March, April, February, but we were tasked. Our athletic director was too damn cheap to get anybody to like take care of the fields or turf because they didn't want to, to ruin it. So no tractors, no nothing to get the field. So we, the men's lacrosse team had to shovel the whole field for practice. So shovel two hours, practice two hours, and then the women's team would come on and just practice and no yeah. shoveling for them. Well, as you should. I mean, that's what a gentleman does. And even though chivalry is dead in 2021, I like to believe it still exists here in Power Athlete. Quick antidote that I have. We, with the shoveling of the snow, one year we were upset about it. So we shoveled a giant. It shoveled all the snow into one pile. And then at midnight, like ran down to the field and formed it into a giant, what we called a glenus. So a giant dick, just prophylactic, right outside outside the girls' dorm. That's genius. Oh yeah, I'll include the picture into the show notes. Uh, just uh, so click through on your links, but that was a fun one. You and know, it's about eight feet tall. Uh, dude, uh, randomly seeing dicks on the ground, like I, I mean, we've seen them spray painted on the ground. We'll take pictures of them. There's actually historic precedents, uh -huh. and I remember this from my ancient uh, from one of my. Uh, classes with Stephen G. Miller, which was the history of ancient Rome, one of the monuments, what they would do is they would actually chisel or have penises all over Rome and they would aim towards brothels. Yep. So you would like follow like the little carved penises around and then it would like lead you to a brothel. To, and this is going to make you jealous, to confirm that when I took the seminar to Rome, I took a bus down to Pompeii. <sighs> Son of a bitch. So Pompeii, the yeah. city that oh, was in, ingrained in volcanic ash and preserved at 91 AD, they got to, we got to tour around and we found the brothels, we found those dicks, and then during the the stage, the theater, mm -hmm. we go in the back, and they have all this different graffiti. It's all just giant dicks. There was so a dude two thousand years. We there were, were, there was a dude actually who got hit with the ash as he was jacking it, and they caught oh, it. We didn't see that on the tour. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it, it was pretty interesting. Like uh, the. You know, it's like we talk about like the sexualization and that. I mean, it was a very, very strong within that culture, especially with the Romans. So, I mean, but I, I just remember like looking at like all these monuments and being like, oh, there's another dick. I'm like, God damn, these Romans were into dick, dicks. Dick, 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 dick. How many dicks is that? A lot. Oh, nice. Well, leave it to Power Athlete Radio to turn training into. Yeah. Dick talk, uh, but okay, so let's get into this. Yes. What is the motion of shoveling? Now, I remember when CrossFit was trying to increase their crossfittiness and they came out with a workout that had virtual shoveling which i thought was hilarious because most people have shovels and you could go out and shovel dirt and not have to do it virtually in the gym for our late adopters john can you please explain the setup and the execution of a virtual shovel so you would take a barbell and you would grab one hand one on the end and you would do kind of a rotation shoveling method like this and they were doing a virtual shoveling workout. Now, I think that that workout only popped up once because the guys on the Iron Garm X, which was a forums that existed in some deal, but it, there was a whole dedicated thread to CrossFit and more importantly, uh, Lamb Basin Glassman. And when the virtual shoveling came out, the Iron Garm went thermonuclear. And, you know, the only people that read it more than us was actually CrossFit HQ. And they never posted that workout again. But a big part of, you know, uh, the original CrossFit football template had to do with this thing called field work. Uh -huh. And where the story comes from is I played with a guy who was, uh, you know, Georgia farm boy. And he, he wasn't all that strong in the weight room. But when we went out to play, he was like a fucking tank. He had like inertia somehow. He was connected to the earth and a big punch. And I remember sliding up next to him. And if you guys have heard the podcast before, maybe you heard this story. But I slid up next to him at lunch and was like, what's the deal? Man, you're barely struggling to bench 225 in the gym. But yet you're out there just fucking crushing people. And he's like, well, I never really lifted weights. I grew up on this thousand acre hay farm in Georgia. And playing football felt a lot like Balen hay. You know, Bale's hay were 300 pounds. And, uh, he was just 
had, you know, big, thick, strong hands. And I realized that there was a certain strength uh, within your hands, you know, and that's where I really got into that intrinsic strength, the idea of folding, you know, folding steel, but that idea of being strong within, you know, within your grip and the ability to be able to rotate and throw and just be strong in different planes of motion. That's where that initial piece came in. So I remember, you know, I grew up a, you know, middle-class white kid in, you know, Southern California. There was no farm work for me to do. Uh, so I had, you know, within our, within the training paradigm, when I went down and we were training with Roth, there had to be a lot of heavy, hard, awkward, rotational type movements. Mm -hmm. So things that, you know, train the grip, we would do, you know, heavy farmer's walks, single arm farmer's walks, you know, lunges. That's where we got the teapots and the drunk steps. And all of that stuff was all about heavy, hard, awkward. And that piece of field work mm-hmm. went into it. And, uh, you know, he, I, I believe that individual was the one that coined field strong because he's like, you know, we were never weight room strong. We were field strong. And when he was talking about field strong, he wasn't necessarily just talking about like football field strong, but actually training in the fields strong. Mm. So when people think about field strong, they, you know, probably thinking about football field and it wasn't, it was about working out here. And, you know, now we live out here in Texas and, you know, cutting down trees and doing all this field work, which I got a lot of it to do this week. Uh, you know, I still got to cut down all these trees from the storms. So, I mean, that's, that's a lot of that inherent strength is something that comes from that intrinsic strength. And we were able to add this into the power athlete template that we taught at the old school seminar and broke it down into different trainable components. First one that, and we almost put these in order that we would like to see it. First one was that awkwardness. Yep. Now for our listeners, John, can you differentiate? We're preaching posture position when it comes to squatting, deadlifting. Now we want to get into an awkward position with our posture and our spine. Why? Uh, it's really easy to pull a bar off the ground with a nice flat back. But yet if you ever watch anybody lift a stone or pick something up, that's heavy, hard and awkward, their back is rounded. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that like anytime you pull anything off the ground, your back has to be flat is kind of misnomer. Now where people get injured is when they start with a flat back and then they end up with a round back. If you start with a round back position, you're able to maintain that round back position, then you're usually okay. And, uh, I mean, this has come to play for me. Man, like so many times in my life have I been in situations where because I was strong, I was able to survive and do shit that other people weren't like uh, the amount of times that um, I've seen somebody broken over on the side of the road, you know, in our power athlete deal. If you see if you see a broken down car, you get out and push Mm -hmm. pulling over and then telling the people and them going to get out. No, no, you steer and then pushing the car out of traffic. Uh, you know, that takes a certain level of strength. The other one is, um, you know, obviously messing. We, we got a, we're going to answer a question from my buddy, uh, Steve, uh, Steven Watson, who's the owner of off-road design, which is a place we get all of our parts for our square bodies. So he'll appreciate this. Um, I went to go find a 79 Ford Dana 60 snow fighter axle, which is pretty rare. And it was in a wrecking yard up in Ukaipa. So I drove up there when we were in Southern California. Uh, the guy goes out there and he shows up, uh, the guy was diabetic on crutches, right? Has his wrecking yards trying to sell this shit off. It's like in the farthest corner buried under dirt. So I got to like uncover this thing. We cut a deal. And then I realize I have to get this day in a 60 with hubs, probably 400 yards to my truck. And I'm looking around, I'm like, Oh shit. So I go back and I get a, uh, a couple ratchet straps, ratchet around and basically did a reverse sled drag with this thing, 400 yards. And then was able to hoist, and these things weigh, what, 300, 400 pounds, hoist one side up and then lifted it and slid it into my truck. And the look on this old man's face was like, I can't believe you did that. And I'm like, ah, this is what I've been training for. Yeah. I was like, dude, I mean, the age old, and I know Harry hates it, but that age old question that I used to ask people and was, uh, was funny, was our tagline for a number of years, but it's hard to have a question as a tagline. And so we kind of got away from it, but the age old, what are you training for? You know, uh, my stuff is like, you know, like, uh, you know, being able to pick up tires and pick up shit that other people can't be able to be physically strong enough to be able to go and do just about anything. Uh, that to me is freedom. I think, uh, when you're not strong enough to be able to just go and be like, oh yeah, no problem. Let's just lift it up. We'll get it out of the way. I mean, I was remembering we went and got the, uh, the pitch arc, uh, belt squat. So me and TC drove down to this guy's place. He was cleaning out his gym and, uh, the guy's like, oh, I'll go get some help. And what, what did I do? We just lifted it up and put it in the back of the truck. And the guy came out and he's like, okay, then. And it's just like, it's, it's freedom to have that level of strength and training. And unfortunately you don't get that stuff with just training with barbells. Nope. 
leading to our next point, grip intensive. Yeah. Not just holding a barbell. Explain why the importance of finding something grip intensive, for example, towel pull-ups, we didn't feel strong today. Yep. Where where do people lose this? It's because they can't do it? They stop doing it in training? Yeah. I Years ago, um, I got a bunch of the Russian training manuals and I pulled a lot of our early kind of training stuff, for, especially for kids from it. But they talked about that you can't develop grip strength after about the age of 19 or 20. And mm. I don't know... I mean, that's what they thought. Now I've since met with a bunch of like, you know, uh, Bert Soren's old man, Pop Soren, who holds like the world record for like, you know, closing the smallest captain crush. And he talked about his grip strength as he matured, actually got better up and doing his thirties and forties, maybe in his late thirties. Uh, but then, you know, over time it declined, but he's still, if you go shake Pop's hand, he's in his seventies now, dude, he'll fucking shatter you. So uh, I remember whenever we go to Sornex, one of my favorite things to do is pick up the anvils by the horns. Mm-hmm. and to be Right able, at the entrance. Yep. Yeah. So they, they have all these anvils sitting on and there's chalk and you basically that was how blacksmiths would test their strength was how big an anvil they could pick up with one hand. So they have a 172 that I was able to pick up and upon pop seeing this upon, you know, now, oh, okay, you're you worthy. Know, yeah, you're worthy now. <laughs> now let's go work on some stuff. But I, I think grip strength from, you know, everything from, uh, you know, not only giving a good handshake, but this is really your connection to all of this stuff. Like if my grip was weak, I couldn't have picked up that Dana 60. If I could, if my grip was weak, I couldn't have done this stuff. And more carryover also into football, what people forget all too often. You know, when they think about offensive linemen or defense linemen, that idea of a big punch and being able to hand fight, what they forget is that you have to be able to put your hands on an individual mm-hmm. in such a way that, you know, you control them. So, uh, you know, the hams become that end of the chain, that extension has to be strong. Uh, you know, um, you know, weak hands or, or, or poor grip is never an excuse. I mean, uh, you know, who was it? Uh, Captain Kirk Kowalski had really small hands. So he trained the shit out of his deadlift and ended up pulling, you know, in the high eights. But if you watch him, his hands were like little sausages and he had to work his grip strength so much because he didn't have the ability to really wrap a massive palm around the bar. Yeah. One of my favorite antidotes that we used to share during the field work section of the seminar, sharing some tales from some coaches that were strapped with equipment and naturally gravitated towards field strong was a dude, I believe, high school football coach up in Detroit. There's two two stories. I forget where they were from. One a dude with had engine blocks and he just welded handles on there for yeah. some farmers carries. Ah, man, where was that guy out of? And the, this um, so 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 back in the day when we taught the CrossFit football seminar, I gave a programming uh, talk and then I would give a template and then you had to go design workouts and uh-huh. then I, that was your test and then I would grade your workouts and I'd get up and present them. Um, one of the uh, that night, you know, when I got the grades back, I used to actually physically grade them and read through them. And I'm looking at, and then I would ask people to present, uh, I'm going through and this guy's got all this crazy shit on there and I don't know what half of it is. It doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, this is going to be perfect. Good. Yeah. Let's get this fucking guy up here. So I get him up to present and he, uh, he told me, he goes, you know, uh, I volunteered to be the football coach at this inner city school. And I can't remember where it was that had like never won a football game in like 20 years. And he goes by, uh, by trade, I am a carpet installer. So he goes, um, I have these like huge carpet rolls. So what we did is I took, I went down and I, um, had them stitch and make these huge bags for the carpet rolls. And, uh, so they actually, so we wouldn't damage them. And we put them in these big, like, kind of like, I don't know what they were canvas bags and we'd zip them. And then he went to the junkyard and bought Chevy 350 blocks, chains, anything he could find. Uh, and then welded handles on it and basically like created all of this equipment from like that was free from a junkyard. Mm -hmm. So these kids had a program that involved Chevy 350 blocks, chains, uh, and all these like weird engine parts, probably axles. I think they, I think they did have, um, four to nine inches that, that, that were obviously didn't have the carriers in them and they would curl those, uh, and then they would actually do squat steps and lunges with these heavy carpet rolls that were in these big bags. Like imagine like a huge like roll of carpet. Yep. And so he designed this entire program and then uh, he started training these kids. And then they went ended up in like three years playing for like the state championship. So they went from never winning a game. All of a sudden he puts his training in, comes in one man band coaching. He's basically the head coach, offensive and defensive coordinator. You know, and he had, I think he had like one assistant. And this team ends up going on and being very, very successful. 
And as he's telling the story about like these kids and like he went in and, you know, inner city, you know, in this you know bad part of town, these kids like had nothing. And he creates this program for them, the strength training around all of this stuff that he gets for free. And now these kids are like focused, they're in on it, they're bought in. And then now, now they have a culture of winning. And as the guy's telling the story, I'm like shrinking in size and being like, uh, like by the end of it, dude, I was practically teared up and I went up and hugged the guy and I was like, you figured it out. You hacked the code on what I'm trying to teach, Mm -hmm. you know, not letting what seems like, uh, you know, insurmountable obstacles deter you from your task, which is helping these people and giving them this program. And, um, he, he crushed it. He got an A plus and, uh, I've kind of felt like I should just sit down and let him teach the rest of the seminar. <laughs> so that's happened to me on a few occasions, um, mm-hmm. where I've gone in and been so humbled by the information that, that people are teaching that I, it just makes me feel tiny. So, um, it's a, it's a good feeling to know that there are people out there. And then it also remember, uh, is a good lesson for me to never underestimate anybody. Mm -hmm. So now I kind of purposely overestimate and hope everybody's great. And then, you know, would rather be disappointed. And I think when you start (laughs) underestimating people, it's because you don't want to be disappointed. So if I just underestimate everybody, I'm like, God, this guy will suck. Then when he does suck, I'm not disappointed. And, uh, but man, this guy really smashed it. I can't remember his name and I can't remember the school, but, uh, wherever you are, man, fucking, we still, we still talk about you. Oh yeah. You are a legend. Last two components, we have full body yep. and then challenge. Yeah. Well, the full body is definitely in that rotation. So you have two, mm-hmm. a few different motions, right? So you have to swing back. So now you're in that transverse kind of, obviously you're in a, uh, you know, kind of a, a staggered stance position. You have to throw your body dig and then pull. So now you're using different, uh, different muscle contractions, eccentric, concentric, isometric, and then you're having to be explosive and then move this stuff and then go back. So it's going to be hard. Mm-hmm. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be full body. It's going to be grip intensive. And it's going to kick your ass. Oh, yeah. And I used to really harp on that challenge, especially when working with high school athletes or female athletes, because imagine a giant tire within your gym or at the high school track. And there's kids that look at that and then believe for a moment that they can't lift it up. And you have the opportunity, the power as a coach to take them where they can't take themselves and get them to lift that up. And then they walk away with a sense of accomplishment that they couldn't do something. So a little bit different than the the perfectly balanced barbell. It's an obstacle, an object where they see I can't. And similar to if you're looking at your football schedule and you see a ranked team on there. Oh, we can't. No. So it's this opportunity for them to accept the challenge. And then do more than they, mm-hmm. they could the day before. Sure. Through you. Mm-hmm. My, my, one of another antidotes we used to tell with the field work, and this is one of my favorites. A coach would have three, three or four high school age students come to his gym. And then part of their warm up was taking the mats, dragging them outside, like beating them down mm-hmm. and then bringing them back into the gym. So awkward, grip intensive, full body, and talk about a mental challenge that, I mean, his parent, their parents were paying this coach to clean his gym. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the other big one is the, uh, the four by six rubber mats. So the four by six rubber mats, you know, three quarters, uh, uh-huh. stall mats, they weigh what, like a hundred pounds a piece. Something like that. And, uh, I remember on numerous occasions having to like set those and move those and like picking those things up, folding them like tacos and throwing them. It was funny. My old neighbor, Joe Capucho, uh, when we were, um, you know, when I had the gym in the downstairs, of my loft, he came over as we were actually cleaning out the gym, uh, after, you know, we got evicted from a place that I fucking owned, which always pissed me off at Newport beach. And as we were picking up those rubber, I was like picking them up and throwing them in the back of the truck. And Joe goes to pick one up to help me and basically almost shits his back out. And uh, he's like, Jesus, those things are heavy. You know, and Joe's, you know, actually was a pretty high level football player, you know, got a chance to play in the NFL for a hot minute and was big, strong dude, but hadn't trained very significantly uh, with, 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 you know, with any real prominence in a number of years. And he was like, you made it look so easy. (laughs) So I always think that that's a pretty good indicator. If you can make something that's heavy, hard, awkward, and really pretty shitty, if you can uh, make it look easy, you're doing it right. Oh, yeah. And how would you suggest for our listeners out there to throw in some field work, no matter the program they're on? Um, any of the strongman stuff is always really good. 
Um, I really like heavy farmers carries. Uh, we have, um, I actually bought the, you know, the implements to train for the Denny stones, Mm -hmm. um, which is still always been kind of one of the, the, uh, fun things I want to do. Um, but I, I think like anything that involves stones, anything that involves any sandbags. So heavy sandbags are, I think are one of the best implements that you can have. We use them quite often in our training programs. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, you know, that was really the basis of third monkey. So, oh, yeah. um, anything that looks heavy, hard and awkward, uh, digging fence posts, uh, moving that type of stuff, you got to cut trees down. So, um, you have to be creative. And if, you know, you have any questions, there's this thing called the internet, you can reach out and, um, you know, Chris surgeson has got a pretty good mm-hmm. Instagram page. So let me give a shout out to Chris Surgeson from Jack street. Uh, he's been doing a bunch of strongman training and has some really fun stuff going on in, uh, in his gym as well. So, you know, yoke carries are another yep. big one. Um, you know, the other one too, if you really want to challenge yourself, if you have a safety squat bar, loading that thing up and being able to walk with that and do, you know, walking lunges, you can also, uh, also zercher it. So there's just, you know, you're only limited by your imagination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Find different places to load and then maintain wherever that may be. Example would be our farmer's walk, right? That's a changing of the load, but we're, we're walking, we're lunging with that. I could bring that up into a rack position and then we can go single arm with those. The weight's pulling you in one direction. That is just awkward enough than staying in your comfort zone of the sagittal plane. So have fun with that. Recapping our field work, anything that's awkward, grip intensive, full body and a challenge. Sounds good. All right. Thank you very much, John. If what's that hotline number again, if anyone oh, yeah. else has any questions, if you are interested in leaving us a question and potentially having us answered on the air, you can reach out to the hotline at 929-464-464-0. 929-464-464-0. Also 929-ing-ing-0. That's right. And this is another episode of the Premier Premier. We are the podcast. premier podcast in strength conditioning, Power That's Athlete right. Radio. And if you love us, go ahead and leave us a review, oh, five yeah. stars, and maybe a funny message. We still have that episode that we're yeah, so teasing. He, here's our deal. If you go to any place that streams this podcast and you leave us a review of five stars and you leave us something creative, funny, quirky, intelligent, that lets us know that you are a regular listener to Power at the Radio, we will read your review on the air and potentially just send you a shirt. Oh. So we'll send you some of our new gear. We'll send you a shirt. So leave us a review, smash us a five star, leave us something that is both creative, funny, witty, that lets us know that you are in the Power Athlete Mafia <laughs> and we'll send you a shirt. All right. You heard it. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Now it's time for you to empower your performance. Head to powerathletehq.com backslash training to choose from a number of programs to meet your specific performance goals. And if you like to break a mental sweat too, visit academy.powerathletehq.com and become a real stakeholder in you or your athlete's success. Until next time, bye!